Hello everyone. So I am here. I am Dr. Shubhang Singh, and I have with me Dr. Karam Singh. And then today we'll be answering few of the very important questions which are there in your mind when you are preparing for your UK <coughs> journey. So all the UK dreamers who want to be a doctor in the UK want to do training, find a job there, or want to do some fellowship. We are here to answer all your questions. So I'll request Dr. Karam Singh. He'll introduce himself and then we'll take a few more questions. So thank you very much, Dr. Shubhank, for that wonderful introduction. My name is Dr. Karam Singh and I'm a UK-based NHS uh, medical doctor and GP who's been working in the NHS for now for the best part of nine to ten years. So, so yeah. thank you very much for that. N nice to have you here. Thank you. And we are super excited to <laughs> launch our amazing PLAB courses. Yes. We have amazing PLAB 1 and PLAB 2 courses. We have huge, you know, a question bank, which is like more than 3,000 questions covering most of the important uh, subjects or aspects of the clinical scenarios. A detailed PLAP2 uh, course for which you need not to travel all the way to the UK, spending a huge amount of money in visa, traveling, accommodation and stuff like that. Everything will be available for you here in India with the most famous medical academy that is Delhi Academy of Medical Sciences. So I would like to start with this question from Dr. Karam, like, uh, you know, this question is always there in the mind of the Indian medical students or the students in different other countries, how mm -hmm. they will adjust themselves in the UK. Do you think this country is like welcoming for international doctors? Absolutely. I mean, UK is a multinational country. You've got people from all over the world, from all parts of the globe who are in the UK. It's one of the most multicultural countries in the whole world actually uh, for example countries like America England is perhaps number one in terms of you know the welcoming approach that it takes for uh, particularly international medical uh, graduates and doctors we need you guys you know the the NHS at the moment is a system that is heavily reliant on you know international medical doctors and now we've come to India to be able to take some of the great from India and bring them to the UK uh, you know just to help them support their dreams and also to help support our patients uh, in the uk as well yeah thank you dr karam that's uh, really very nice to hear so my next question is many doctors who are there in their internship or in the final year mbbs want to know like what they can do to prepare their cvs you know what things they can add to be like similar to the british foundation year doctor so that you know their cv is also equally good Please throw some light on it. So essentially, when a when a, a faculty member from a hospital looks at a patient or a doctor's CV, they're mainly concentrating on the experience that they've had, and that includes the hands-on experience. So, for example, if you're a surgical doctor, the number of surgeries that you've done. If you're a medical doctor, the number of medic you know the years that you've been working in your particular medical field. Um, so experience is perhaps number one on your CV. The other things are things like research and publications and papers. All of those things weigh less heavily on a CV, I would say. So perhaps experience being the most important thing. And obviously just your interest outside of medicine. You don't have to be, you know, the greatest doctor to come to UK. You have to be, you know, a human. You know, you have to have interests outside of medicine. And those are things that they, they also look at as well. Right. Very nicely said. So compassion and empathy is very important. <coughs> and you have to understand that in this country they give lot of weightage on the interpersonal skills the way you talk to patients you know how you break the bad news how you explain things to them how you involve them in their care it's a kind of a menu card you present and the patient choose it's not like you force a patient to get that treatment and as dr karam rightly said definitely your clinical experience you have to put it nicely in your cv then comes if you have any teaching and training experience if you were teaching your juniors, nurses, medical students, you can mention that. If you have done any training courses <coughs> like ACLS, BLS course, any other course, you can mention there. If you have attended any conferences, CMEs, webinars, seminars, you can uh, mention there to show your keen interest in that particular field, maybe so of oncology, cardiology, what do you want to do spe later in your field. Then some clinical audits if you have done. I'll ask separate question on this because Many international students don't understand what is clinical audit and what is quality improvement project. And then you can mention any sort of volunteer work you have done or any other interest you have other than medicine. So Dr. Mm. Karam, now please uh, tell us more about clinical audits. Many students want to know about this. So clinical audit is a process in which doctors demonstrate quality improvement within their workplace. 
So, I mean, a very simple example is, uh, for example, if you're working in a surgical specialty and you're looking at the number of infection rate in, the, in a particular department and you're working with other doctors to try and improve that infection rate and you institute changes within your department or within your trust if it's a larger audit uh, in order to improve patient pol uh, quality of care and that doesn't necessarily have to be done in England you can do it in obviously uh, you know doctors who, who graduate from India can also be involved in quality improvement and that on the CV always bodes and looks uh, you know you know looks looks good on your CV very nice yeah. so basically in clinical audits you compare the guidelines of your hospital or the ward where you are working with the national guidelines and then you can definitely do, as Dr. Karam said, some quality improvement projects <coughs> to improve the outcomes, whatever it is, whether it is infection control or some communication which you have introduced or some technology which you have introduced, maybe use of tab or something yep. like that yep. <coughs> to make the discharge process easy or so. On the whole, I have also worked in the NHS, done fellowships and all. I feel, you know, there is a huge scope. They are very uh, innovative in terms of assessing your, uh, you know, curiosity and your talent. So my next question would be, uh, Dr. Karam, how to prepare for the interviews? You know, many students struggle that they are not getting interview calls and when they get it that they have a negative response only. So how they can prepare for interview? Can you throw some light? Yeah, so I mean, interview is perhaps one of the most important parts of the application process. That is where you can showcase yourself to the, to the panel that's interviewing you. They know your CV. They have your CV in front of them. So you simply regurgitating your CV is not what they're looking for in the interview. They may give you, for example, a cl clinical scenario and see how you manage that depending on the particular specialty that you're applying for. But more likely, and the interviews that I have chaired in the past, is they'll give you an ethical dilemma or a situational judgment and ask for your judgment in that particular situation. How would you handle this based on ethical principles and based on uh, principles of good medical practice? Very nice. So yep. basically, you know, you can divide it into four parts. First part is they ask you introduction, you know, let us go, uh, go through your CV. So as Dr. Karam rightly said, there is no need to like start from the school, etc. Just tell them the highlights, like what, <coughs> how many years of clinical experience in which department, how you are interested, what kind of trainings you have done. So go through that and show that you are very enthusiastic for this particular position. And when you are preparing your CV, it is very important that you show according to that particular job requirement. Always read the job specification. Many candidates say they have applied in 300 positions but not getting a single call because you are not tailoring your CV, which is very important according to job description <coughs> so that you fulfill the essential desirable criteria. Second part, they ask you clinical scenario, as Dr. Karam said, where you answer how you probably managing a sick, unwell patient, the protocols, ABCD assessment, what you have studied, what further they may ask you some leading questions on it. <coughs> Third would be definitely ethical scenario, as Dr. Karam mentioned, like if you are in this kind of scenario, for example, your colleague found drunk, taking alcohol in the ward or something like that, yeah. then these kind of scenario, how you will, and then definitely something related to how you are going to, you know, uh, improve the ward yeah. uh, or the, clinical services in the ward with your presence, how you fit into this job. And man, many a times the interviewer I have seen, I have also given so many, hmm. they ask you whether you have some leading questions. Yeah. So it's very important that you ask them few questions yes. like what kind of uh, training opportunities are there, whether this post is approved for training by the deanery. Mm -hmm. Some candidate just say thank you, you know, we don't have any questions. So yeah. And, that, and that's a good way to show keen interest is by you coming with a preset question to show your enthusiasm and, and you know, as you said, why, why do they want to hire you, okay? What is it in you that separates you from, you know, the, the hundred other candidates that are applying for that particular yeah. job role? So you're right. Tailor your interview for the job that you're applying for. Learn about the, the role. Learn about the hospital. Learn about the area and, and, and show that enthusiasm on interview day. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Karam, tell us about different uh, doctors, grades and, you know, positions when they apply because when you go on that track application yep. or any just jobs application, there are a lot of things coming up like, you know, what they should choose, what other jobs mm. IMGs can do initially. Again, this, this depends upon your level of experience. However, if we look at the training pathway first, so I'll start with the training pathway, although a lot of doctors from uh, international, you know, international countries come into non-training roles, the traditional UK pathway is you start very uh, at first with your foundation year one. 
If you pass your foundation year one, you will move on to having four GMC registration, which is foundation year two. And then you decide which way you want to take your career, whether that's going into locum work or a, what we call a foundation year three program, which is out of training, just locum work, just you working on an ad hoc basis. Or if you want to go directly into training, whether that's core surgical training, which is two years, and then you go into your relevant surgical specialty, or whether that's internal medicine training, which will be a three-year program, and then again, you go into your relevant medical specialty or general practice, which is a three-year training program. So post F1, F2, you can either become an F3 or foundation year doctor three, or you become an ST1 or a CT1, which is a speciality trainee year one, or a core trainee year one, which is particularly important for the surgical trainees and also the psychiatric trainees. Now, for international doctors, where do they fit in? So it's unlikely that an international doctor will start at the level of FY1. There are there there is a route into the NHS for doctors who have just finished their MBBS or their undergraduate degree and they wanted to come to UK directly for FY1. That is via the UK Foundation Programme Office, and that's a completely separate system for application. Or most doctors come at the level of a senior house officer. Now, for senior house officer, you have many different names. Uh, for that, you have FY2, you have SHO, they can call them junior clinical fellows, they can call them trust grade doctors, they call them junior specialist doctors. So every hospital has got its own name for a senior house officer, um, depending upon which part of the country you're in, essentially. But they all mean the same thing, okay? They're, they all yeah. mean the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And if you have more experience, you can be like applying for senior clinical fellow, yeah. specialty registrar, specialty doctor, specialist doctor and it takes you a while to become a consultant ultimately yes if you want to practice in the hospital you are a hospital consultant if you want to be a gp then you can practice in the community so uh, now my next question is a little tricky dr karam you know Go on. Yeah. a lot of strikes happening you know people see the news etc yes do you still think you know we can survive in the uk with the present thing what kind of salaries we get can you please so that's an interesting question. This this so this month actually, uh, September 2023, the UK government has already increased the pay of every single non-consultant doctor within the United Kingdom. So every junior doctor from FY1 all the way through to ST7 or whether you're an ST3 in, in general practice has had a 6% salary increase with an additional £1,250 that has just been added to their salary in the in the upcoming days. So the salary increase has already been there for the doctors. In terms of the striking, the striking continues despite this pay increase. So what does that mean for the doctors? That That's a good thing, okay? It means more money, more training opportunities, and particularly those that are coming abroad, they will benefit from an enhanced pay package. Um, so yeah, it is a good thing for doctors. Right. So uh, how do you say like you have done the USMLE part, you have also lived abroad, you have seen the Indian counterparts also and worked in the UK. How do you think like uh, how is this UK journey so fascinating, you know, every medical school you will find students who really want to go to the UK and click some pictures in front of the big band London Eye on the Thames Bridge and literally, you know, they feel fascinated. So what do you want to tell them, like, what are the really important things in the UK training? I mean, UK is a great country. I was, I was born and brought up in the UK. I did train abroad and then I came back to the UK. As you mentioned, I did the US Emily and I finished that back in 2015 with the aspiration to go to America. However, that didn't happen because I chose for it not to happen. And I, I pursued my career in the UK and I pursued it because I enjoyed it. So while I started at the level of FY1. Um, and I had such a fantastic experience during my foundation program that I didn't want to spread my tentacles and grow to different countries. I felt that the training was so robust and so intimate and personal for me. And that's helped me come become the all rounded, you know, the rounded clinician that I am today. So the, the UK training opportunities in the UK are immense and fantastic doctors are, you know, uh, waiting at the end of that cct when you do become yeah. a consultant or a gp as well yeah <coughs> so i think training pathway is good there is a lot of scope for international doctors because this is so this thing vibrant that doctors from all over the world are coming to uk especially in london you could see people of all nationalities as if you are interacting with the whole globe and you learn a lot like in my experience what i have seen so mm -hmm. <coughs> dr karam uh, what you would say like uh, uh, you know what kind of importance these courses play like we are running the plab one plab two how do you think this can really help 
the Indian doctors or the doctors in Asia who are preparing for these exams, like doctors in Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, who all are watching our video, hmm. even from Africa or other countries, Egypt, etc., they give lab exams. How do you think this course can be really helpful for them? Well, well, you've got two people who are working in the NHS currently, and I think that's the biggest advantage that our course has, has over many of the other uh, the courses available for the PLAB exam. Look, medical textbooks have got all the information that you require to become a doctor. Yeah, For the past you know, five, six years during your undergraduate training, you learn from a multitude of different textbooks. And these courses are not, designed to make you a doctor you are or you already have that title but what these plab courses have and particularly the one that we're bringing to you is that uniqueness to teach you about the nhs about the system the roles and responsibilities of a doctor and how patient management happens at every stage whether that's for diagnosis investigations that you need and also treatment options that will vary from country to country and that's what we bring yeah so i would like to really thank you Dr. Anjum Kohli and everyone who is part of this great course, I would say Dr. Sumesh Sethi, who is the Chief of Delhi Academy of Medical Sciences, Dr. Mala Srinivasan, who is basically the key contact person to run international courses. <coughs> I think it's an amazing experience to start something like this. And we would like to say all the best to all the doctors who are preparing for their PLAB exams, who are UK dreamers planning NHS journey. And you all should click picture in front of this uh, big ban and send us to us uh, you know on social media we'll be very happy when you will write after this course you were able to complete your uk journey all the best all the best thank you bye bye